Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really nice to be here virtually. So what I'm going to talk about today is some work that I've done with my co-authors Nina Kamchev and Anita Liebenau. And we did this, or at least we started this maybe, I don't know, December 2019. And then we, we worked on it on and off through 2020 and it sort of appeared this summer. Um, but there's some, I guess it's a, well, you'll, I'll tell you about the area. There's some very nice questions and there's, we're still planning to think more about it. So let me start with some motivation from the graph side. So there's a very uh, famous theorem of Goodman uh, that says that the density of monochromatic triangles in any two coloring of the edges of the complete graph is asymptotically at least a quarter. So when n is very big, any way you color the edges of your complete graph on n vertices, you're not going to be able to make the number of monochromatic triangles, so the number of triangles that are all red and the number of triangles that are all blue, the proportion of that, you're of those over all the triangles, you're just not going to be able to make that any smaller than a quarter. And so if you think about it, if you take a random coloring, then the expected number of monochromatic triangles is going to be a quarter. So this the Goodman theorem essentially says, right, the, the, a random coloring minimizes the number of monochromatic triangles. But so the random coloring isn't, in fact, the only coloring that would give you this density. Imagine taking a complete bipartite graph, coloring all the edges across blue and all the edges in the parts red. That would still give you the same density of monochromatic triangles, but it's not any smaller than a quarter. Okay, so this is triangles. Why don't we think about um, general complete graphs? So Erdős made a conjecture in 1962, um, which said, okay, so Goodman's theorem says essentially that the random coloring minimizes the number of monochromatic triangles. The conjecture of Erdős says, um, in fact, for any complete subgraph, complete graph, the density of monochromatic copies is going to be minimized by the random coloring of the complete graph. This is a very nice conjecture. And I don't know, maybe 18 years later, Burr and Roster made a much bolder conjecture. And they said, in fact, this is true for any graph H. So for any graph H, uh, you can't make fewer copies, monochromatic copies in a coloring than if you just take a random two coloring. So two very, very nice conjectures. Um, let me just define some words that are going to help us talk about these things, right? So I, I keep saying these, I don't know, we, I talk about graphs where the density of monochromatic copies is, is asymptotic, at least the density in a random two coloring. Well, this is, this is something that eventually got a name. It was common. So let's say that a graph H is common if the density of monochromatic copies inside the clique is asymptotically minimized by a random coloring and uncommon otherwise. So what do these conjectures say? Well, Erdős's conjecture says that T at least three, KT is common. And the burr roster conjecture says every graph is common. Now, unfortunately, what, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, um, both conjectures are false. So uh, independently in 1989, uh, both Thomason and Sidorenko came up with examples of graphs that are uncommon. So uh, Andrew Thomason construct, well not constructed, uh, managed to prove that the uh, K4, the complete graph on four vertices was uncommon. So this in fact disproves both Erdős's conjecture and the Barbosta conjecture. Um, and Sidorenko independently proved that a triangle with a pendant edge is uncommon. But so even though these conjectures are false, uh, there's many graphs are known to be common, and there's a whole field, or not field, um, there are many people who do research into proving whether graphs are common or uncommon, um, so that various graphs that are known to be common, things like trees and cycles and even whales, and there's a very, very nice result of uh, Jaeger, Stavichek and Thomason from 96, 
which says that in fact any graph containing a K4 is uncommon. So that gives a whole family of uncommon graphs. Um, right, so and it's, it's kind of interesting because it's saying the only thing you need is the, the graph to contain a little K4, right? Anything else can happen in your graph and you somehow can't make that common. So I'm just like to briefly mention the Sidorenko property. Uh, so you, you may have heard of Sidorenko's conjecture, which is a famous conjecture in graph theory. This is a property that um, is often, people think about Sidorenko property commonness together. Um, so I'll just briefly tell you what it is. So a graph is Sidorenko. Uh, if the density of copies of H in a graph with fixed edge density is asymptotically minimized by a random graph of the same edge density. So I'm not going to talk so much about Sidorenko in this talk, um, but you probably know Sidorenko's conjecture, which says that all bipartite graphs are Sidorenko. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, you might want to take a second to uh, understand why it, do it just doesn't make any sense for non-bipartite graphs. It's not going to be true. Um, the, then the relation to this talk is basically if, if a graph is Sidorenko, then it's common. It's not too difficult to show. So in fact, a lot of work uh, has been done towards proving various bipartite graphs do satisfy Sidorenko's conjecture. And in fact, right, so all of those graphs are also common. So that's another uh, way of that people have learned about common graphs because a lot of people are really interested in Sidorenko's conjecture. So they... Um, we learn things about common graphs the same way. Okay, so I've spent some while talking about graphs, but what my talk is about is systems of equations. So let me tell you uh, about the analogs of these properties in the equation setting. Um, so yeah, I'm just we're just going to be thinking about simple equations such as, as this: the form x plus y plus z equals zero. So what's the kind of setup that we're going to think of? Well. Let's consider uh, an equation that looks like this. So we've got k variables, x1 up to xk. We've got coefficients, a1 up to ak. So you can consider these things. You can pick the ai in your favorite finite abelian group. You can pick them to be integers. In, in everything that we've done, we are considering our coefficients to be in fq for q some prime power. Um, but you can imagine them to be whatever you like. And, and there, there has been some work done in the other settings, for example, the finite abelian group setting and things. Um, so we've got this, this equation, we've got our coefficients. And that's, so we can describe the systems, like not the systems, the solutions to this equation. So what are they? They're just k tuples where each, right, x1 up to xk, where each entry is a member of the group or the integer or whatever it is, the setting you're in. And um, they're the, the things that satisfy the equation. So for example, if we take x minus two y plus z is equal to zero, then this is just um, three term arithmetic progression, right? So the solutions to this equation are just the set a, a plus d, a plus two d. Right? So that's, I guess, sol of this equation. So what we're going to be thinking about is solutions in particular sets. So we can define sol LA to be all the k-tuples of elements in, in some set A that satisfy the equation, right? So if you think about it, um, if we pick some subset A, then if we think about solutions in either A or A complement, that, that sort of corresponds to coloring the elements your field. And so the solutions in A are the say, blue and the solutions in A complement are red. And if we're looking at how many solutions there are in either A or A complement, that's that corresponds to thinking about monochromatic solutions. So general questions, I guess, that um, we think about, but also kind of many, many questions in additive combinatorics can be phrased in terms of for a particular equation and particular setting, what can be said about the number of solutions? Is there always at least one solution? But what can be said about the number of solutions in A plus the number of solutions in A complement? 
So I've just got now two very classical examples of questions that I guess are, can be thought of in this way. So van der Werden's theorem, a very, very nice theorem, um, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, which says, okay, let's, if you color the one up to N in whatever, if I've, I've said two colors, right? You can do it with R colors. So any two coloring of one up to N, the large enough N, one of the colors is going to contain a K term arithmetic reference. So I actually, sh I should have said, um, any two coloring contains a monochromatic K term arithmetic progression. Obviously, one up to n contains an arithmetic progression of length n, right? So you've got your integers, one up to something, you color it in here, two colors, but it's also true for R. As long as n is big enough, one of your color classes is going to contain a K term arithmetic progression. So I guess here's my, my picture. If we've got one for, uh, so obviously this is one arbitrary coloring and the theorem says for any coloring, this you're gonna get a monochromatic arithmetic gretin. But I guess, right, if you look at nine, if you color it red, you're gonna get three, six, nine. If you color it blue, you're going to get one, five, nine. Um, and you might just say, oh, well, I've picked the colors to, so that it's going to work in my picture. You can try and find your own color. And I think you're not gonna be able to color one up to nine so that you get a monochromatic arithmetic progression. So this is just an example of a classical kind of combinatorial theorem, which is talking about essentially the solutions to some particular equation uh, in, in either a set or its complement. It just says the number of solutions is at least one, right? Well, we either have a red solution or we have a blue solution. Um, again, very famous Roth's theorem is it, talking about the number of arithmetic progressions, right? So you can think of that as saying, right, the number of solutions to this equation in a particular set. So you, I'm sure you all know way more about Roth's theorem than I do, um, but right, it just says that if you've got a set A with no non-trivial three-term arithmetic progression, then we can, we can bound the size of this set A. And uh, Samarady's theorem says essentially the same thing for four-term arithmetic progressions, or in fact, um, arbitrarily long arithmetic progression. So these are all very, very classical theorems, and they're all essentially saying something about the solutions to particular equations in certain uh, sets. Okay, so let's think about the kind of thing we're going to think about today. So as I said, this is our equation for now. We've got a kind of form, we've got these coefficients in FQ, we've got our solutions um, we've got some notation here. So what we want to talk about is the notion of commonness and potentially sodorenko ness of linear equations. So we'll say that a, an, an equation is common over FQ if the density of monochromatic solutions in any two coloring fq to the n is asymptotically at least the expected density in a random two coloring. So it's the exact analog of what you'd want the definition to be for, if you sort of translate the graph property to the equation property. So you've got some equations. Um, we've color fq to the n, so that just says, let's take some set A and a complement. Let's look at the solutions that are in A, and then let's look at the solutions in A complement. How many of them are there? Well, it's common if basically the way to make this number as small as possible is just to take a random coloring. And that's what common says. It sort of says there's no clever construction where you can pick a clever set A where you can make the number of solutions in A plus A complement smaller than what you would get if you just take a random coloring. So it's possible to make a sort of, I guess, a more quantitative definition. So I've written sensible here. So for any, what we'll say, sensible system or, or equation, um, we're going to say that it's common if for all A or all subsets of A, we actually have 
it satisfies this. Um, the reason I've written sensible here is when we think about the setting, so at the moment we're thinking about just single equations. Um, what I'm eventually going to talk about is systems of equations. And this system of equations, there are, there are sort of silly things you can do, but a very small number of silly things you can do that make this definition, well, or you write this, this quantitative bound not hold for systems of equations, but essentially any kind of sensible system of equations, you want to show it's common. What you do is you want to, you want to prove that the number of solutions right, in some set A plus A complement is always at least this number. Um, and we won't worry about the, the silly ones. They're not particularly interesting. When I say it's not, it's not that they are difficult or bizarre, it's just they're not interesting. Um, well, it, uh, yeah, I, I didn't want to talk very much about them, and I feel like I've just spent a long time going around telling you why they're not interesting, but not really saying anything. Um, we can talk about that later if, if you're upset by my use of the word sensible here. Um, okay, so this is our definition. So we, we've got, we're thinking about the single equation case now, but eventually we plan to think about when I say we, I mean us today, we're going to think about the um, system of equations. So we've got this definition of common. And so in 2017, um, there's a very nice paper of Saad and Wolf who asked the question, which equations or systems of equations are common or uncommon? Um, it's a very nice paper because they, they look at, I guess, a number of there are many nice examples of different sorts of equations and different properties, and they prove quite a few things. And it really was a, yeah, um, kind of there's lots of nice questions and directions of things to think about this. We, we, we really like this paper. Um, and they also ask analogous questions for the Sidorenko property and think about that as well. I'm mainly going to focus on common today, um, but they do talk about that as well. So Let's just do one very little example here. So let's take our favorite equation, which is a three-term arithmetic regression. Um, we can parameterize the solutions right, by saying x, y, 2y minus x. And so let's, let's count the number of solutions in A and the number of solutions in A complement. And we can see, is the three-term arithmetic regression, is it common or not? So actually for the three-term arithmetic regression, we can parameterize these solutions and we can write um, exactly the, the number of solutions. So we've got the, right, we just take the sum over all x, y. Uh, this first term here counts the solutions in A and the second term here is gonna count the solutions in A complement. So we're just gonna, the indicator function will just pick out when these things are in our set. Um, what we care about is the density, essentially, so let's just divide by the total number of solutions and add a q to the minus 2n here. Right, and now if you use the fact that the indicator function of the complement is equal to 1 minus the indicator function of the set, and you just rearrange this equation, it all works out very, very nicely, and what you get is something that looks like this. And this is... So what's, what's kind of nice about this single equation, this, this 3AP, is we've actually got an exact expression for this density, right? There's no inequality here. We've literally said the number of solutions here is exactly this expression on the bottom right. And so I've, here I've written an inequality, but it is, it's for this case, it is an equality, um, right? And this, so this tells us that 3APs are common because we look at the right hand side, that's always at least the density in a monochromatic coloring. So in fact, right, the, the nice thing about these three APs is we, we have the exact number of solutions in A and A complement. And this argument actually extends, it's a very, very similar argument uh, to any single equation where K is odd. So any kind of three variable equation or any five variable equation, you can do the same argument you can find, you can, you can write down these solutions that the number exactly. Um, and then in fact, right, this proves that they're all common. So we know that when K is odd, our single equation systems are all common. Uh, so what about when K is even? Well, 
Uh, Zaz and Wolf proved that when k is even, we've got our equation here. They proved that it's common whenever the coefficients can be partitioned into pairs summing to zero. Right, so for example, an additive quadruple um, satisfies this condition. And they conjectured that in fact, um, the, the equation was common if and only if the coefficients can be partitioned into pairs summing to zero. And so this was proved by Fox, Pham, and Zhao uh, a couple of years later. Um, so this theorem here, I've written, I've written three sets of authors here because each set of authors proved a, a different part of this theorem. So Cameron, Cilarello, and Sarah wrote, came, came up with this very nice argument, which says that the equation is common whenever k is odd. Uh, Sad and Wolf proved one direction of the second part and Fox, Femme, and Zhao proved the other direction. So altogether, uh, the work of these three sets of authors completely characterizes these single equation systems for the property of commonness. So we know that we've got a single equation. It's common whenever k is odd. And when it's even, it's common if and only if the coefficients can be partitioned into pairs which sum to zero. So that's very nice. This is in incredibly well understood. And the the Sidorenko property for single equations is also similarly well understood. Um, so yeah, here's my example of my additive quadruple, which explains this condition here. Okay, so we know, we, we very well understand systems of a single equation. What about systems of more than one equation? So this was something that was, was both asked by Sad and Wolf in their paper, and also, Fox, Pham, and Zhao asked at the end of their paper, they said, OK, single equations we understand very well. What can you say about systems of linear equations? Right. And this is, this is essentially what we were thinking about systems of linear equations. So for example, a four-term arithmetic regression is a system of two equations. Um, what can you say about systems of multiple equations? So various things were known. So especially for the four-term arithmetic regression. So in 2010, Julia Wolf showed that this was uncommon over ZP. Uh, Tim Gowers has a very nice kind of random-like construction of density one half, which has few monochromatic four-term arithmetic regressions. Both of these um, constructions really use the geometric structure of four-term arithmetic progressions. Um, which is, it's very nice, but somehow, I guess, so Sad and Wolf asked in their paper, so they spent some time thinking about it. They showed that this four-time arithmetic progression was uncommon over F5. And they said, well, is it the case that any system containing a four-term arithmetic progression is uncommon? So this is sort of in flavor, uh, asking a similar question as the result of Jaeger, Stovacek, and Thomason told us. So remember that that result said that any graph containing a K4 is uncommon. This question says, is any system containing a 4AP uncommon, right? Is there, there's something special going on with this 4AP that if our system contains it, we, um, we then, we just, we can't, whatever we add to our 4AP, we can't make it common. Okay. So this is a very nice question. This is something we spent a long time thinking about. So let me just briefly, let's think about it. So what is the question? Is, so is any system containing a 4AP uncommon? Um, so obviously we're, we're gonna think about these linear homogeneous systems. What does it mean to contain a 4AP rate? Um, so if we look at our system, well, okay, this is a four-term arithmetic regression. You can say, okay, two of the equations in your system have to look like this. Well, that's not quite it. Because if we take linear multiples of our 4AP, we can get two equations whose solution space is exactly, right, it's, it is, it's still the 4AP. So what do we mean when we say we're containing a 4AP? Well, we mean that if we look at the solutions to our system of equations, there's a way to parameterize the solutions in a way that we have these four coordinates here that correspond, right, that are parameterized in exactly the way they would be in a 4AP. So 
So uh, we've got a whole set of solutions. We've got these other coordinates um, and they could be whatever they want. But when we say containing a 4AP, this is precisely what we mean. It means when we look at the solutions, there are these, there's this, I guess, kind of four dimensional subspace or not four dimensional, but we've got these four coordinates who are parameterized exactly like the quarter mathematic progression. And the question is, is, is this enough to make a system uncommon? So our main theorem of our uncommon paper essentially says that, in fact, right, the, if this is true. So um, Q sum prime power and L is again a sensible system um, over FQ, then if, if our system contains a four-term arithmetic progression, then in fact, the system is uncommon. So for example, um, silly example, a five-term arithmetic progression is uncommon. In fact, right, any system which contains a 4AP is uncommon. But in fact, what we prove is something that's much stronger than this. So if we think about, um, if I sort of abuse notation and I call a 4AP a A, A plus C, A plus D, A plus 3D system, right? Because I said, that's how we're gonna parameterize the solutions of this 4AP. And okay, there are other things there. I'm just, I, I'm just to simplify the slide. Um, one way of writing our, our theorem can be thinking, thought of it as, as this way. In fact, what we show is that if L contains any system, subsystem that's parameterized in this very broad way, right? So X, Y, X plus B, Y, C, X plus D, Y with very, very mild conditions on these A, B, C, Ds, right? We just said that they're not zero and essentially the determinant of this matrix is not zero. So if we have any subsystem that whose solutions are parameterized in this way, then in fact, the whole system is uncommon. Right? So it's not just the case that, so somehow you might hope or that the geometric structure or something special about the four-term arithmetic progression is what was making everything uncommon that contained it. But somehow this is saying, well, actually, the fact that this A, A plus D, A plus 2D, A plus 3D, the, the coefficients here, they're not, I mean, that's not the reason somehow. It's the exact same proof that shows that this kind of system is uncommon, that, sh that shows that the 4AP is uncommon. So somehow the system world, the, or for, for the property of uncommonness, the 4AP isn't particularly special somehow. Um, but yeah, so I guess this is what I just said. Somehow we don't use any particular structure of these coefficients in our proof. Okay, so maybe I have some time to give a couple of technical slides about how rough, very roughly, how the proof of this goes. So in fact, there is an equivalent sort of functional notion of commonness. Uh, so for some function from FQ to the N to R, and some system of equations, uh, we can define this lambda L of F. Um, and what should you think of this as? Well, it's basically the average weight of a solution under F. So what are we, we're summing over every solution here and we're taking the, the product of, I guess, right, the weights of each element in this solution. So we've got this lambda. Now, I said there was an equivalent functional definition of commonness. Um, so again, for a sensible k-variable system of equations, it's common if and only if for every function here between fq to the n minus a half a half, then it satisfies this property here. So the, the density of this a half plus f plus half minus f using this definition above is at least two to the one minus k. Um, and in fact, so this equivalence between the functional definition of commonness and was, was also used in the sad wolf paper and it was also used by Fox, Pham and Zhao. Um, it's actually a lot, it's, it's quite convenient when you want to, to, to work with the functional definition rather than to work with the actual 
the initial kind of setup. Um, so this is nice. So it means that essentially what, you, what we're doing now is we're trying to think about functions rather than sets. Um, so how, how, what do we do? Well, we think about this functional definition of commonness. So what we have is we, define, we, de we, we came up with this theorem, which basically gives a condition for uncommonness. So what does our theorem say? Well, again, we, it says that some sensible system is uncommon if we can find some function, uh, the weight, the kind of sum over all elements in FQ to the n is zero, um, but such that the sum, so essentially we've got our system L and we want to know whether or not it's common, right? So we have this, I'm just going back a slide. So we've got this definition of commonness for L. Um, it says, okay, it's common if, if you can prove for every function here that it satisfies this property. You take the weights of these things for every function. Now, essentially, um, for what does our technical theorem say? Well, it says, here's a condition um, to show that a system is uncommon. It's enough to find some particular function f that, that satisfies this problem where we sum over critical subsystems. So what is a critical subsystem? Well, the, the important thing to know is that the critical subsystems always have rank one or rank two. So they're either single equation systems or they're systems of two equations. So this, the technical theorem, I guess the, the power of it is that you've got some system of equations. L, there might be, it might be very, very big. There might be loads of equations. It's essentially saying, if you want to show that this is uncommon, it's enough to basically find a function f that has some property on these critical subsystems. And the nice thing is that these subsystems are small. So the, we've got these things, right? They're either rank one or rank two, these single equation systems, these rank two equation systems, right? But we know sort of single equation systems are very, very well understood. And somehow it's, it's much easier to try and, at least from our perspective, it was much easier to try and think about constructing some function that could, that we could make the sum over all these small things small, less than zero, rather than to try and come up with um, some function that, that works for our whole big, big, complicated, multi, big rank system. Um, yeah, so the, okay, so once we've got this theorem, then essentially what we want to do is we want to be able to construct a function that has this property for these low rank subsystems. So roughly, how do we do this? Well, what we want is we want the sum over these critical subsystems um, to be small for some f. Um, and actually, it's easy to show that this is small for the rank one systems if the non-trivial Fourier coefficients of f are small. So I'm going to, I'm going to, wave my hands around a lot now. I'm not going to give you any incredible precise um, things or any technical definitions because it, it will it's quite technical and it's probably not very much fun to put on a slide. Um, so essentially let me give you a very rough idea of how we construct this function f. So we we pick our function f. Um, so we, we have some operator g and we have some other function psi. So we, we find this operator G so that for any, so psi, I guess, is a function just like F. We, we can find this operator G so that for any psi, um, basically this operator makes the Fourier coefficient small. So it's, uh, the, so Tim Gow is in his construction of um, these four, to find these sets which have small, number of monochromatic solutions to four-term arithmetic regressions essentially does, does this. So he finds some function awesome. and then he multiplies it through by these um, kind of omega to the power of various things 
And this multiplying it through by these things means that the whole Fourier coefficients of what you're left with is small. Um, so essentially, we use the same idea that Gowers uses. So we make this operator that once we've got our function psi, it makes the Fourier coefficients. It makes them small. So, and that means that the rank one systems actually we're very happy with the, the sorted because, and that's, that's quite easy. Um, so the rank two systems. So this means that we, we pick our operator in kind of a clever way. Um, so that when you look at this sum over these two dimensional subsystems, it picks out. So I'm, I've written four AP here. So I'm supposing I'm trying to just prove this, this theorem for the, the four term arithmetic regression. You can replace this with your favorite system that I've described. Um, so somehow you can, you can define the operator in a way that when you look at this sum, what happens is everything becomes very small apart from this, this four term arithmetic regression, this, this kind of. So essentially, what you have to do at that point. So this operator is very nice because it kind of gets rid of the rank one systems. And then it says, well, on your rank two systems, it makes everything small apart from this four term arithmetic progression. It, and it, it brings out this a lambda four AP psi. And so then what we have to do was we have to construct a function psi that works for the four term arithmetic progression. So if I go back maybe to this definition here, right? Um, so it's sort of for the four term arithmetic progression, we sort of had to construct a function directly that makes, that makes this lambda for AP psi small. Um, and in fact, this, this function here that we work for psi, that works for the four term arithmetic progression, um, it works for any of these systems that we're talking about, these little kind of four, four coordinates that are parameterized in this certain way. So there's kind of two things. So there's one, one you have to construct this psi that just works directly to say something about this density in the four-term arithmetic regression to say that it's, it's negative. And then the second thing is you get, you make this operator, which then sort of turns what you want into this thing that you've already shown. And I realized that was a very, very kind of hand wavy description. Um, and but I suppose it's, it's probably, yeah, I don't think there's, there's time to write out in detail what all these things are. I'm not sure how much you would, might get out of it. Um, okay. So what, what should you take from my uh, technically confusing slide? Right, we've got our theorem that reduces the problem to showing something for low rank subsystems. And we can use techniques that, that basically um, Gowers uses and, and ideas that come up from the Sad Wolf paper and from the Fox Farm Zhao paper, um, kind of a combination of these ideas that allow us to do this. Okay, so let me maybe in the spend two or three minutes um, giving some closing remarks and some problems, and then you can ask me some questions. So the first thing I want to say is that, in fact, this result for the, to show that any system contains the four-time arithmetic progression is uncommon, um, was actually independently proved by Leo Verstegen, who's a PhD student of Julia Wolf, simultaneously kind of the same time we proved it. So our theorem is a much more general theorem and it applies to all these other systems as well. Uh, Leo's theorem also, so it doesn't, doesn't prove it for all these other systems, but he does prove it for various other settings such as in finite abelian groups. And so it's kind of, I don't know, our work intersects on this one theorem, but then we, we both prove other things as well. Um, so one question that I get a lot when I talk about these things. So I guess um, people who are more interested in graphs and combinatorics often ask, well, we, we really care about Sidorenko and common graphs. Is there anything that you can say, um, like it, does proving things about equations help, uh, right? Is, is it the case that you can translate the equations to tell us something about Sidorenko and common graphs or the other way around? 
Um, so actually, there's a, a kind of there's a nice section in the South Wolf paper where they they chat a bit about this. Um, I think it, it's not really the case that the results from one that that okay, it might be the case that in a few very 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 tiny specific cases there could be a result from one that might translate to the other. It's not the case that there's some general correspondence between graphs and the equation setting. But what is nice is that in, in both areas, the techniques used for proving things seem to translate. Um, so we, we have a paper where we've proved things about um, Sidorenko systems of equations. And in fact, we used a lot of inspiration from papers where people proved Sidorenko things about Sidorenko graphs. Um, so the results themselves, maybe they won't translate. Well, I would be very interested if you, if you could find out that they that you can somehow um, go from one to the other. But somehow I think spending time thinking about one and proving things in one setting, it could benefit the other because maybe the proof techniques translate across. Uh, so just to, to summarize what we do know, so for, for a single equation, this has been really, really well characterized, right? We said that we know that a single equation is common whenever k is odd, and if k is even, it's common if and only if the, partition, the, the coefficients can be partitioned into pairs that sum to zero. Um, it actually, Right, this property, it's common if and only if the coefficients partition into pairs that sum to zero. Um, in fact, you can prove that systems of equations where the coefficients partition into pairs that sum to zero. So I guess one direction, um, you, it sort of translates to these systems of multiple equations. So suppose we've got these, these two equations here. Um, if the pairs of coefficients match up, so if, right, if we have our whole system of equations and you can sort of pair the coefficients globally in a way that they match up, well, it's quite easy to, see, to show that actually this system of equations is common. So that, that direction does hold kind of this analogous thing for systems of equations. Um, so our theorem gives us a large family of common systems with this, these these pairs matching up, these very, very structured kind of things. We've also, um, the proof actually shows that this is a Renko, but we're not, I'm not gonna talk so much about that. Um, and as in the graph sitting, Sidorenko implies common. So yeah, we show that this is a Renko and they're common. Um, so we've got lots of, lots of equations, but very, very structured ones that are common. We've got a big family um, that is not common, right? So our theorem says any, any system containing some subsystem that looks like this is uncommon. But unlike this one equation setting, right, we don't really, we don't have a very nice characterization of them all. And we, we don't even have a conjecture for what a nice characterization of them all might look like. Um, so I guess the, the, the thing that, I, mean, I think it would be really nice if there was some nice, clean classification of these common, uncommon Sidorenko systems. At least with our current techniques, we're sort of far, but I don't know, there are various things that we might like to try to prove. Uh, maybe not convinced enough that to, to conjecture anything. Um, about about various other systems, but there's definitely there's definitely a lot of interesting specific systems going on. Uh, if you if you if you're interested in this, in both of our papers, we've got some remarks and some discussion about specific systems that seem to sort of exhibit phenomena that suggests that various proof techniques that we're doing uh, not. Somehow we're not, we're not necessarily thinking about this. Either it's very complicated or we're just not thinking about this the right way to get a very nice full classification. Um, and another thing we can't even answer um, is, is there a system of multiple equations that is common but not translation invariant? And by translation invariant, I mean that the, the coefficients sum to zero in each equation. Like that seems to be um, like a very simple property. 
um, we, we're, yeah. So I think, I guess my conclusion is that there's a lot of very, very nice questions in this area. It's still pretty wide open. So we've proved some things. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. So there's, there's several groups of people that have proved some very nice things, um, but there's still loads of questions. And if any, any paper you look at, there's a lot of very interesting questions. And even when we were kind of thinking about this, we kept a doc, we've got a document of about five pages of interesting questions that we, that we would like to think, that we spent time thinking about, we haven't solved yet. Um, they're not, they didn't all end up in our paper, but somehow there are just, there's, there's a lot of open directions. There's a lot of nice things going on here. So I think maybe I will end there so that you have some time to ask me questions um, if you would like.